faith and works, trust and obey. You're not saved by works, but if you truly believe, works will be the result that show up in your life. Works that are pleasing to God, works that are in obedience to the Word of God, works that are done in the power of the Holy Spirit, works that are done to the glory of Jesus Christ, tests of good works in the Scripture. I hope you've memorized those things. I've said them to you over and over. Those are the things that the Bible says about good works. You're not saved by them. You're not sanctified by them. But they are the result of a life that is truly saved and committed to Christ. Take your Bibles and turn back, if you will, for a moment to that passage that we read just a few minutes ago in Exodus chapter 12. We're on part 9 today, looking at the ten plagues. My, what an incredible warning lesson. Warning lesson for the children of God. The things that are written in the Old Testament, the Apostle Paul tells us, were written for our edification. They're written as examples for us. They're to teach us what not to do so that we won't get into trouble now. Are you ready when the chastening hand of God comes? And it will come. We're going to talk about that today. The plagues that we've studied so far, blood, frogs, lice, flies, murrain, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and now we're in the final plague, the death of the firstborn. The mnemonic device. Can you say it with me? Are you ready to say it with me? I told you there's coming a day <laughs> when you are going to have to write this down. <laughs> I'm going to give a test and there will be some rewards. And for everybody who does not say it properly or write it properly, you're going to get 30 lashes with a wet noodle. <laughs> Here they are. Let's say it together. Blow, fro, lie, fly, move, bow, hey, low, daddy. If you can remember that, you can remember all ten plagues in order. The blood, that's blow, fro, frogs, lice, lice, fly, flies. Moo, that's the cows, the cattle, murrain. Uh, lo, locust, da is... What was the last plague we just studied? Darkness. Darkness. D-A is the first two letters of it, darkness. And D-E is the first two letters of death. death. Okay, you've got it. Blow, fro, lie, fly, moo, bo, halo, da, D. All right, now we're in Exodus chapter 12. We've already laid the foundation for the doctrine of judgmental blindness. That's what we're covering right now, which is very well you know, exemplified for us in these final two plagues. Judgmental blindness, which is the key to the final two plagues, the plague of darkness and the plague of the death of the firstborn. That's currently, as we've seen, the reason that the Jews are not able to, right now, see the truth when it is so plain in Scripture, which points to Christ. Their hearts have been blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And we began that study of judgmental blindness with a detailed overview of Romans chapter 11 that tells us that even though they are now in blindness, God has not cast them away. And I'm not going to read that entire passage again. It's a, it's a long passage. Romans chapter 11 deals with that entire subject. And in fact, it covers eight different doctrines that tie into the Passover. Very important doctrines in Scripture but we'll not cover all of those again, though I may list them for you in a moment. We had the question raised for us last week in Romans chapter 11, verse 11, when Paul says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? And that particular question caused us to look at God's purpose in three key areas. The purpose for the judgmental blindness that came upon Israel. You know, the Bible tells us, even the wrath of men shall praise thee, the remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. So even when we see bad things happening in the world, even when we see God's judgment in the world, it is designed for a purpose, and it is always, Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them were the called according to his purpose. So even when we look at the chaos of the world around us, and we certainly are living in a world filled with chaos today, with wickedness, with sin of every kind, with terrorism, uh, with incompetency, with graft and embezzlement and slimy nations working against slimy nations, we live in a world of wickedness. The Bible says, Even the wrath of men shall praise thee, the remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. God does that. He puts it together in a way that we cannot comprehend. He is infinite. We are finite. Our mind cannot, cannot grasp, cannot get around what God is doing in the world, but we know that he has promised the end result. That's what we're moving toward. We're in the last days, folks. It should give you encouragement as you see this because you see it prophesied in Scripture. 
But we saw the three purposes that God gave to us in Romans chapter 11. The purpose for why this judgmental blindness has come. Number one, there was a purpose in the fall of national Israel. There was a purpose in it. We'll see it in a moment. Number two, his purpose in their failure to remember the true meaning of Passover, which is what we are studying. Number three, his purpose in Israel's failure to understand and apply the teaching nature of the law, that salvation is not through the law. You cannot get saved by keeping the law. There are too many people that think, oh, the reason God gave us the Ten Commandments is that so we'll have a, an outline of what we have to do to be saved. No, God gave you the Ten Commandments to show you that you are lost. There is no way that any man, woman, boy, or girl can keep all of the law. Certainly not all the rest of the law, but not even the Ten Commandments. Book of Exodus, we have all kinds of stuff about the law. Book of Deuteronomy, we have all kinds of stuff about the law. The book of Leviticus is technical details of the law. No one in this room, or listening over the internet, or listening later on a CD, no one has ever kept the law perfectly except Jesus Christ. You cannot keep the law. God gave the law to show us he is a God of holiness. And there is none that doeth good, no, not one. They have altogether gone out of the way. They are altogether become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. The law was to show us God's holy standard and that we do not match up. You will fail every time. If you try to get saved by the law, you will fail. If you try to sanctify yourself by the law, you will fail. And that should drive you to Christ. That's what Paul says in Galatians. The law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Only Jesus can save you. You cannot save yourself. There is no way that the law keeping will save you. And so that's why we find God sending judgmental blindness was his purpose in Israel's failure to understand and apply the teaching nature of the law that salvation is not through the law, but only condemnation comes through the law. That purpose is stated in the second half of verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, now here's God's purpose in allowing it to happen. Through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles. Dear people, that's us. If Israel had seen it straight from the beginning, we wouldn't be here today. We'd be out in pig and darkness somewhere. You see, that's the grace of God. The wrath of men shall praise thee, the remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. And God caused through the fall of Israel into judgmental blindness the salvation of Gentiles. How we thank God for that. And we talked about how it's crazy to be anti-Semitic because if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall be the receiving of them but life from the dead when God brings back his blessings to Israel as he has promised to do in the scripture? What blessing lies ahead? And you think of the millennial blessings that are described all over the Old Testament and described in detail in the book of Revelation when Jesus reigns here on the earth. And he will. The scripture guarantees it. What blessings will there be for us then? Well, we finished laying the foundation for the final plague by seeing how Paul brought us full circle to the ultimate meaning and application of Passover, the final plague of death of the firstborn when God delivered Israel from Egypt. He ties in eight key doctrines. These are the things that are covered in Romans 11. We're not going to look at them all over again, but I'll just list them. Number one, the remnant principle. Number two, judgmental blindness, which is what we're looking at right now. Number three, chastening and loss of rewards. Number four, eternal security. Number five, restoration of blessing for repentance. You can't get God's blessing unless you repent of your sins. We talked about that just a moment ago. The guaranteed future in the land of promise for national Israel, the permanent nature of the covenants of God, and the spiritual gifts and the grace of God. And we concluded that Romans chapter 11, verses 16 through 36, provides the interconnection for all eight of those doctrines as they relate to Passover. We also saw that the Temporary judgmental blindness of Israel is detailed in 2 Corinthians chapters 3 
and 4. And I had just read through those briefly last week. I'm going to read them again just so you have the background for where we're going today. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance. Now remember, that's at the giving of the law. Israel has just crossed the Red Sea. They've gone to Mount Sinai. And Paul is referring back to the point where Moses receives the law, the Ten Commandments, from God at Mount Sinai. If the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away? Did you get it? There are so many even evangelical churches today who are trying to put you back under the law. The law is given as a rebuke to our wickedness, not as a means of salvation. We have the Ten Commandments posted on the corner of the school building, corner of Haddon Avenue, Cuthbert Boulevard. We don't put it there so that people can get saved by looking at those and think, oh, I'll keep the law and I'll get saved. It's there to show them they cannot keep the law. They've taken it out of the public schools and now what do we have? A bunch of illiterates who don't know anything about the law of God, which stands as judgment over them and to which they will someday fall. The law of God is to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation, that's the law, be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. And he's just told you what that was. The ministration of the Spirit, the preceding verse, defines it for you. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect. Comparing one thing to another, remember we compared a, a kid's plastic bubblegum ring to uh, the Hope Diamond one looks very glorious to the kid, but when you lay it next to the Hope Diamond, oh, the glory of the first one is nothing. How much more the glorious ministration of the Spirit of God. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such a hope, we use great plainness of speech. Paul says, not pull any punches here. Get over it if you've got a hang up on that. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Doesn't mean we can live lawless lives. Paul is not telling them to be libertines. He's not telling them to live like they want to live. He's telling them, instead of living in the flesh trying to keep the law, live in the power of the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. When you try to keep the law in the flesh, it will only wear you out. But as you are transformed into the image of Christ day by day, the working of the Holy Spirit of God in your heart to transform you, to, to change your mind, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, metamorphosis, metamorphosized, by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You want to be in the will of God? Let the Spirit of God transform your mind. Paul is contrasting the law with the ministration of the Spirit of God. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. The judgmental blindness is also stated in verses 14 through 16. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. They don't understand that the law was given to drive them to Jesus. The law was given to show them that they are wicked sinners. The law was given so that they would understand they cannot stand before a holy God. The veil was there, but it's taken away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses is read, Moses, that's the Pentateuch. That's the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those are called the books of Moses. When Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. They can't see through it. Nevertheless, when it, that is their heart, shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Christ removes the veil because he shows them that salvation is not by works. Salvation is by the grace of God through faith in him alone. He paid for their sins. That's the point of the cross. If you can work your way to heaven, the cross is unnecessary. 
But the cross is absolutely necessary. You cannot be saved without the blood of the Lamb. You see, we're back to Passover. That's how all of this ties together. That's why we're looking at Passover, why we spent so many weeks on it. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Do you have the blood on the doorposts of your heart? Are you feasting on the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? Oh, dear beloved ones, there may be someone here who is still in blindness and still in the plague of darkness. And you don't realize that there is light in the dwellings of Israel. You're not feasting on the Lamb. The blood's not over the doorposts. And the angel of death is coming. Are you ready? I weep when I think of it. I think of the people, and I can remember specific ones in the past, with whom I've shared the gospel and have scorned and laughed at me. I pray that God will at some point have changed their hearts. In 2 Corinthians 4, Paul tells us that Satan is the instrument that God uses to cause judgmental blindness. I mentioned that last week. We want to go a little farther with that today. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Because I'm not trying to soft-pedal stuff to you. You know, there are a lot of preachers out there today that preach cotton candy and you know, ice cream, and uh, they make everything sound sweet and nice and bubbly and all positive and, you know, power positive thinking, Norman Vincent Peale type of stuff, but in a modern garb. Paul says, I don't deal with the scripture that way because we're talking about a holy God. We're talking about the Creator God. We're talking about the God who knows every thought of your heart. He knows every motive. He knows why you do what you do. He knows every attitude that you've got, even if it doesn't show up on your face. Not just listening to your words. I mean, that would be enough. Think about recording all the words that everybody, seven billion people on the face of planet Earth are saying it all the time. Can you imagine that? How many tape recorders would it take to record all those things? And would you want to sit and listen to it? God does! And Jesus said, every idle word that men shall speak, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Oh, little tongue guards your speech. The tongue is like a fire. It's a world of iniquity. It sets the world on fire. James tells us that clearly. Well, I've gotten off of my subject here. Satan's the instrument that God uses in judgmental blindness. It says, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. We've already seen how God uses judgmental blindness for wicked pagans, but God also uses judgmental blindness for believers. We've had a clear illustration of that for a wicked pagan. God sent a lying spirit in the mouth of Ahab's false prophets to guarantee that he would die in battle. We studied that in 1 Kings 22, 1 through 40 in detail. I'll not recount all of that now. And so we wouldn't miss the point. That narrative is also recorded in 2 Chronicles 18. And he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, Thou shalt entice him and thou shalt also prevail. Go out and do even so. Now therefore behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of these thy prophets. And the Lord hath spoken evil against thee. And that brings us to where we closed last week. A warning to believers not just to wicked unbelievers like Ahab. That's why God warned the Christians in Romans not to be high-minded, but to fear. That's what we closed with in Romans 11, 19 through 21. God will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. That's written to Roman believers. Be not high-minded, but fear. 
For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Written to believers. Don't get so wrapped up in a proud one-sided view of eternal security, which is indeed true, that you forget the doctrine of the chastening hand of God. And here, as we close, is where grace is found. There's a kind and wonderful and glorious side to that as well. Chastening proves love. And we gave you a lot of illustrations of that last week. Chastening proves love. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. The child that the Father loves will be the recipient of chastening in the physical realm as well as in the spiritual realm. Earthly fathers are supposed to reflect the Heavenly Father in applying the rod to their children. I gave you passages out of Deuteronomy, out of Proverbs, out of Hebrews, of course, which is the one that we're most familiar with. And Paul spends at least ten verses on that subject in Hebrews chapter 12. And he closes with verse 11, which says, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Thank God when chastening comes into your life. Because what God is doing is He's removing sin. He's straightening you up. He's giving you all that is necessary for further walk. And He's teaching you righteousness. I thank God for the times of chastening that I've had in my life. Some of them have been pretty hard. And I thought, Lord, you're sure spanking me hard for what doesn't seem like such big sins. You know? And I'm not going to tell you what they are. You can just guess what they are, okay? <laughs> Everybody wants to know, oh, the pastor sinned. What did he do? What did he do? Forget it. It's between me and God and anybody whom I've harmed. I've already taken care of that with them. So that brings us to part nine today. Part of chastening being judgmental blindness where we no longer see the goodness and blessing of the Lord in our lives even though he is sovereignly in control and loves us and he works all things together for our good according to his eternal and sovereign purposes. That second Corinthians chapter four shows us how God reverses judgment into restored blessing that was lost by the fall. We preach not ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, that takes you back to creation, has shined in our hearts. Creation, everything was dead until God breathed life into the creation. That's what your heart was before God breathed life into your heart. We were not sick in trespasses and sins. We were dead in trespasses and sins. God has shined into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. God breathed into Adam, and Adam was made out of what? Dust. He was dirt, man. He was dirt. <laughs> and you and I are dirt. When you die, and you will if Christ tarries, think about it. I think about it every day. I think, Lord, I have one day less to serve you than I had yesterday. Please help me to use every second of today in a way that brings glory to Christ, the maximum amount. I don't want second best. I want first best. I wake up with those thoughts every morning and all day long. I try very desperately to get through the interruptions and the, the silly trivia and nonsense of earth to get to important things. Do you? It's on my mind constantly because I know I'm going to have to stand before Jesus Christ. I'm going to have to give an account for the things done in this body. The scripture says so, whether they be good or bad. How do you face your morning each morning? Do you gripe and complain about it? You think, oh, I'm going to sleep in, I'll roll over and get a few more winks. Or, man, today, hey, I don't have any obligation. I'm going to trash today. I'm just going to lounge around and do nothing. Pop chocolates in my mouth and watch TV. How will that count for eternity? Think about it, dear people. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. You're made out of dirt. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. He wants to work in you and through you for the glory of Jesus. 
Notice that creation context we just read there in 2 Corinthians 4, 5 through 7. Judgmental blindness fell at the beginning on the entire creation immediately after the fall. Judgmental blindness goes back a very long way. And Paul explains that in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and following. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. God breaks the judgmental blindness in Christ, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God, here we have judgment. Where is it found? Where was it first found? The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. The word hold there means to suppress. It's a wrestling term. To grab and hold somebody down. There are people who do that with the truth. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. That's their conscience as he deals with that in Romans 2. For God has showed it unto them. Romans chapter 1 verse 20. How else is man responsible for knowing God? For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Man is responsible for knowing God through creation. But are there those around us who are suppressing the truth, who are wrestling it down to the ground and trying to hold down the truth of what creation reveals and telling you that it, it, it all happened by chance, it all happened by evolution, it, it, it was all you know from goo to the zoo to you? invisible things of him the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made that's the creation and what can you understand from it even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse because that now listen to this carefully this brings us to today because that when they knew God they glorified him not as God neither were thankful two things giving God glory that's praising him for what he is Neither were they thankful. That's praising him for what he's done. Who he is and what he's done. Who he is and what he's done. Who he is and what he's done. They gave him not glory, neither were they thankful. Gave him not glory, neither were they thankful. Does that characterize America today? It sure does. But became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise. They have 14 PhDs. They became fools. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. There's evolution. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. There's a sexual morass in which we find ourselves today. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. <laughs> what do you think the environmentalists are doing? Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this God gave God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And we now have official sodomite marriages in the United States. Do you follow America going through the pattern here in Romans chapter 1? And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do all those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Kids, that's in that same list. Same list as murder. Same list as fornication. Same list is full of envy and malignity, haters of God, <clears throat> disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection. That's the natural affection that parents have for their children and children have for their parents. There are different kinds of love in the Bible, and one of them is, is the natural affection, the natural love that exists between those who are members of the same family we find now abortion killing babies, your own children. We find euthanasia getting rid of the old people to make way for the younger people. Implacable, unmerciful. Who, knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. That went back to disobedient to parents. Remember that? Remember the list he just gave you? About 30 different things here. 
God says those are worthy of death. That's the book of Romans. That's the New Testament. That's one of the big doctrinal books of the New Testament. We're not going back under the law. God, said, God says through Paul, this is what I think of those sins. They not only do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. Although we do not want to admit it, the United States is currently, currently living under judgmental blindness. That's our topic, judgmental blindness. The United States right now is currently living under judgmental blindness. God has turned our country already over to our own lusts. And that's seen in at least four different ways. Number one, in the Obergefell v. Hodges Supreme Court case this past summer, God has turned us over to our own lusts. Women who've forgotten what it means to be married to a man. Men who've forgotten what it means to be married to a woman. Who burn their lusts one for another. That's the first sign that God has turned you over to the judgment, the judgmental blindness. Number two, the rise of Muslim power and the terror attacks. Every morning I see on the computer, my kids gave me a tablet for Christmas, and I am struggling to learn how to use that thing. But one of the things that happens when I turn it on is the, the top news stories pop up. I cannot believe how many Muslim attacks are happening all over the world right now? I mean, people being murdered in Africa, 400 people being kidnapped by Muslims. Uh, what's going on over in Saudi Arabia? And what's going on over in all these other places? I mean, Burkina Faso and in the Philippines and Indonesia. And I mean, it's bizarre. Number three, the vitriolic presidential debates. And everybody likes to listen to the guys fighting and tearing each other up. And the Democrats are saying, look how the Republicans are ripping each other up. And the Republicans are saying, look how the Democrats are reach, ripping each other up. And uh, Bernie Sanders in, is complaining about they've only given him four, ten minutes out of uh, the last four months uh, of news coverage and all this kind of uh, He's like, people, that's not where it's at. The vitriolic presidential debates that essentially avoid all of the key moral issues that God is angry about in Romans 1 that I just read you. They ignore those 30 things. There's where the problem is. It's not whether somebody has a citizenship or was born so-and-so a place, you know. They refuse to point the finger where God points the finger. They refuse to stand up and be a prophet of God who says, I now have a public platform. I now have a national platform. I have a platform that can be listened to by 365 million Americans. And I'm going to tell you where our problem lies. It's not the economy. It's sin. Dear people, That's a sign of God's judgmental blindness. And number four, which is perhaps the worst. You say, well, I thought that Obergefell of the Hodges was a, was a pretty bad worst. No, there's one that's worse. One that shows that we're currently living under the judgmental blindness of God. And that's the apathetic, do-nothing attitude of the real Christians who refuse to engage their culture, stand for the truth, or do anything about the rotting culture because they are too busy enjoying their own personal peace and prosperity, as Dr. Francis Schaeffer used to say. Wake up! Judgmental blindness is already upon us! It's like the taunting cry of Delilah to the sex-saturated Samson who was, in fact, a true believer. We know that because he's listed in Hebrews chapter 11 as one of the heroes of the faith. Delilah's mocking laugh when she said in Judges 16, 20, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. 
He'd gotten away with his pleasure-seeking, self-centered, sensual carnality. So many times before, they failed to recognize that he would come to a point of no return. Yes, there was judgmental blindness that came here. He had his eyes poked out. Remember, he'd heard those words from Delilah on at least three other occasions. She kept, you know, pestering him and pestering him and pestering him and pestering him. Tell me the secret of your strength. And tell me what it is that makes you so strong. And he had lied to her here and he'd lied to her there and he lied to her there and he finally got tired of it. And so he told her the truth. But each one of those times that he told her something, he got a little closer to the truth. And each other time, when he fell asleep in her lap, a man totally tied up with sex. Each other time, she did what he said to see if it really would remove his strength. And there were always Philistines hiding, waiting to see, waiting to see if this was the day they would get him. You remember it. In verse 9, Now there were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber. And she said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he breaks with, she, he said, Tie me up with these little green, uh, you know, like vine kind of things, and that makes me lose my strength. He break the whisk, as a, toe of, a thread of toe is broken when it toucheth the fire, so his strength was not known. That was back in verse 9. We get a few verses later, verse 12. Delilah therefore took new ropes and bound him with them. Because he'd said to her, you know, if I get tied with brand new ropes that have never been used for anything else, if I get tied with really brand new ropes, man, that, that'll take it all out of me. And she said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. She had done this before. And there were liars in wait abiding in the chamber, and he brake them off his arms like a thread. See, he's playing with fire. He doesn't know it. He thinks, I'm, I'm cool. I can get away with my sin. I can just keep right on being carnal. And he's listed as a hero of faith. His faith must have been listed in terms of its length of, in nanoseconds. In verse 14, two verses later, he said, you know, if, if my, my hair gets tied in this braid and then you take a pin and you you nail it through the hair to a beam then I won't be able to move see he'd gotten a little closer he's now talking about his hair so she did it she fastened it with a pin and said unto him the Philistines be upon thee Samson and he wakened out of his sleep and went away with the pin of the beam <laughs> with the web he just got up and walked away and pulled the whole post over But in verse 20, after he told her all his heart, she went to the Philistines and she said, he's told me his heart this time. This time I know it's real. And when he fell asleep in her lap, she shaved his head. You see, he was a Nazarite. He had been dedicated to the Lord from birth. And no razor had ever touched his head. It was a lifetime Nazarite vow. We've talked about the Nazarite vow. If you've been here with us on Sunday evenings, and Paul fulfilling his Nazarite vow when he goes to Jerusalem and is, is caught by the mob and they're trying to kill him and the Romans rescue him and so on. We're in that portion of the text right now. He was fulfilling a vow that was a temporary vow. But Samson had a lifetime vow. And it doesn't matter whether he cut his hair or somebody else cut his hair. That was the key to his strength. And his power was gone. He woke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself. But he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. There's a lesson for us in this, folks. His refusal to live in the power of the Spirit of God, his refusal to live in obedience to the Word of God, cost him five things. And it's going to cost us those five things here in this country. Number one, he lost his freedom. Do you see it coming? 
we are already under the judgmental blindness of God. I just gave you the four reasons that we know we're under the judgmental blindness of God according to Scripture. Number two, he lost his honor. We're so busy worrying about what the world thinks about us that we don't care what God thinks about us. They love the praises of men more than the praises of God. Number three, he lost his sight. There's a visible illustration of judgmental blindness. They put out his eyes. They made him work as a slave, grinding like an ox. Number four, he lost his position of authority as a judge of Israel. Samson was one of the judges, you know that. He lost his position of authority as a judge of Israel. He became a slave to the uncircumcised Philistines. And five, it ultimately cost him his life. Judgmental blindness is serious. And God judges carnal believers severely, even those who are heroes of faith. The doctrine of judgmental blindness is confirmed by Paul in his second letter to the Thessalonians. God sends the judgment, but God uses Satan as the instrument for causing the blindness, not only to reprobates and unbelievers, but to believers as well. Let me read you this passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. We're moving down to that period of time, folks. Paul's talking about the appearance of the Antichrist. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Those are the three words that are used to speak of Christ's miracles in the Gospels. Power, signs, and wonders. Except with the Antichrist, they're called lying. Powers and signs and wonders. They're good imitations, but they're a lie. with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. Remember what he did back with Ahab? God said to that lying spirit, yep, I'm sending you. You go. You get in the mouth of his false prophets and you will win. You'll get him to go into battle and I'll kill him in battle. God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. What have we been talking about? Judgmental blindness on the United States. We just went through it in Romans chapter 1, 30 different things. Here's the scary part. God uses Satan as an instrument of judgment against believers as well. 1 Corinthians 5, beginning at verse 1. Pull your Bible out. Look at it. How do you know that I'm reading you the Bible and not reading you the Quran? <laughs> I guarantee this is not in the Quran. <laughs> but you want to check it. Look at it in your Bible. And it's related to sex sins, which our culture is saturated with. It's reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. That's what the church should have done. They should have been mourning over there, puffed up about it. Hey, we got Christian liberty. <laughs> that he that hath done this deed might be taken among, away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already. People are saying, don't you judge me. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Well, the problem is, they don't quote the rest of the verse. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, you shall be measured to you again. Just make sure that you're judging righteous judgment. Paul judged. I have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not doing this on my own authority. This is what Jesus says. When you are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, you've got his exousia. You've got his authority. Not really his dunamis, but his exousia. To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. This is a believer who's living in sexual immorality. 
to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He doesn't lose his salvation, but he's going to lose his life, and God is going to use the devil to be the instrument that takes him out. And when Satan is used as the instrument of God's judgment, he doesn't namby-pamby, wishy-washy around about it. He delights in it. He glees in it. He thinks of the worst ways that he could possibly torture you. He hates you because you bear the image of God. And you as a believer, you're on your way to heaven, and he can't stop that. But he can certainly do something miserable to you before you get there. Do you understand? God uses Satan as an instrument of judgment against believers. That's the scary part. He says it again. It's not the only place we find it in the New Testament. First Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou mightest by them war a good warfare, holding faith. We're in a warfare. Did you know that? Do you know that we're in war? I'm not talking about Al-Qaeda. I'm not talking about all these other Boko Haram and ISIS and all that stuff. You're in a warfare. Paul describes it in Ephesians chapter 6, where we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against, oh, scary, scary things. You're at a war. You may not like it, but you're at war. Most Americans didn't want to be in the Vietnam War, but they were at war. Most Americans didn't want to be in the Korean War, but they were at war. Most Americans didn't want to be in the Second World War, but they were at war. Most Americans didn't want to be in the First World War, but they were at war. Most Americans want to be involved in the Civil War, but they were at war! And you are at war. That thou mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. They've put away their conscience concerning faith. Now listen to verse 20. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. What if the church found out about your sin? And it was among the categories of sin that Paul lists in Romans chapter 1 or elsewhere. They're bringing shame and reproach to the name of Christ. And as Paul gives the instruction in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the church gathers together. And under the authority of Jesus Christ, delivers you to Satan that you might learn not to blaspheme. Delivers you to Satan because of your immoral sins. Delivers you to Satan because of some other sin that's in your life. Church doesn't do it anymore. It used to be called excommunication. Church discipline. When was the last time you heard about church discipline? Churches get sued because of church discipline. Oh, years ago there were a number of very important church discipline cases that the person coming under discipline, I can remember one back in Texas where there was a, a woman committing adultery with, a, and she was a member of a church, committing adultery with the mayor of the town. The church put her under discipline for it because people had found out about it. And she sued and she won. So now churches have to have all kinds of special little, you know, clauses when their membership uh, list, when people join or when they renew their memberships, uh, that says, you know, the church can discipline me. So most churches just don't bother. And people slide on in their sin, and churches are dying between 50 and 100 a day all over the United States. You understand we're in a warfare. The devil is knocking off troops because the troops have refused to obey their commander. Your people. This is serious business. We're not playing church. Whom I have delivered unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. God uses Satan as an instrument of judgment against believers as well as against wicked pagans. That's the scary part. Now we've talked extensively in the past, and I'm going to have to close down here quickly. We've talked extensively in the past about the difference between the sin unto death and the unpardonable sin. They're not the same thing. 
The unpardonable sin is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Mark chapter 3, verses 28 through 30 explains that it could only be committed by those who saw the miracles of Christ and then those who attributed the miracles of Christ, the supernatural power of Christ, to the devil. So I won't repeat all that discussion here. If you've been coming on Sunday evenings, you heard me preach on that extensively. But the sin unto death is what we're dealing with here in judgmental blindness. The sin unto death puts you in the terrifying position of having God use Satan as his chastening instrument to bring you to a most horrifying death. The sin unto death. It can be in moral areas of sin, like the sex sins of Samson and Corinth. It can be in theological sins, like we see here with Alexander and Hymenaeus, who were denying that the resurrection is past. They weren't denying the resurrection of Christ. That's central to the doctrine. They're just saying it's past. You say, well, what's so bad about that? You know, resurrection is past. Nobody else is going to rise from the dead. We're all just going to be spirit beings. We'll be sort of like those, that Greek uh, mythology stuff where you just go on from ion to ion to ion to ion, and you get higher and higher in the spirit realm. Paul delivered them unto Satan for that. It can be a combination of morals and theology because your theology determines your morals. We can see that in both these passages that we just read. Friends, I hope that that has struck in terror to your heart. Remember the setting for the first Passover? It was the darkness of judgmental blindness, a blindness that was followed by death. I have a series of questions that I've written down here. Are you in the plague of judgmental darkness sent by God himself? You can only answer it in your own heart. Have you hardened your heart to the one who declared that he himself is the light of the world? Number three, are you walking in the flesh, lusting after the leeks and lentils of Egypt? Oh, here are the Israelites. They were out in the wilderness and they... They wanted the leeks and the lentils of Egypt, and they grabbed and complained against Moses. Is your gluttonous belly your God? Is your mind saturated with sex? Are you a lazy, indolent sluggard and sloth? Is your heart filled with envy? Are you a greedy, covetous worm chained to the temporal garbage of earth? That's where the worms go, is to the garbage of earth. Are you angry and bitter, jealous and petty, manipulative and focused on trivia? Are you so proud that you refuse to admit your own sin? I just covered the seven sins of the, of the seven great sins. Judgmental blindness is overtaking you as I speak. Return to the light. Confess your sins. Repent of your sins. Walk in the light by faith before the Philistines chain you in slavery. Do you not remember that the Shekinah was darkness in all the dwellings of the Egyptians? But it was light in the homes of Israel. As a believer, are you walking in the light or are you walking in sinful darkness just waiting for Satan to be used as an instrument of judgment against you? The angel of death passed over every house where the blood of the lamb was over the door and the doorposts. But if people were not in the house, they weren't covered. Make sure that you're inside and that you are feasting in fellowship on the Lamb. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We all resist being convicted of our sins. It's natural to the human heart. We're not only sinners by action, we're sinners by nature. And so we don't like it when we hear a message where a sin is pointed out, especially if it happens to touch us in any way. We'll make excuses, we'll rationalize, we'll argue. But you've called us to repent, to confess our sins, knowing that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Knowing that if we walk in the light the light of the Shekinah, the light that was in the dwelling of Israel. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood, oh, the blood of Passover, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Father, I beg you, help us each and every one to take advantage of the cleansing blood of Jesus. 
we see the judgment has already come upon our country. It's not we'll be judged because of these sins. It's these sins are proof that your judge blunt of blindness has fallen on us already. Deliver us from evil. Our Lord taught us to pray that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing